Buenos, buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Gustavo Gordillo y empezamos con esta sesión informativa del BRC Impact Diverton. Gracias a todos. Gracias, Gustavo. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm Kathy Bazan, and like Gustavo, I am a consultant at the Business Recovery Center trying to find my share screen button. Hang on here, guys. Um, and I help business owners, just like Gustavo does, find the information that they need to run their businesses better, as well as uh, the money that they need to keep going in these rather interesting times that we're going through. All right, if this little button happens to work, we're going to have, there we go. All right. My name is Kathy Bazan. As I said, I work out of the Tualatin Chamber of Commerce office. Previously to being a small business consultant, which I started doing in 2014, I was actually working in social media. So I built the Facebook page for a corporation from zero to over 9,500 likes. In two and a half years, never bought an ad. I also learned a lot about what makes a terrific website. So today, we're not going to be going into what kind of HTML code you're going to need, but rather, what are the design features that you could put into your website? So when you're doing your website yourself, or if you hire somebody to do it, you have some knowledge of what you can include to make your website look gorgeous. Gustavo and I work for the Business Recovery Center. All of our work with you is free of charge, and it's confidential. As I mentioned, I'm Kathy. Uh, in addition to writing social media content, I've also written content for a blog, and I'm going to be sharing my secrets on how to do everything I learned in social media with you today. So first question, what is your market? Well, is anybody on the internet? The internet is a communication network that was invented by UCLA and Stanford not Al Gore, as he once claimed. The World Wide Web is a section of the internet where documents are stored. Now, these could be Word documents, spreadsheets, but it's also websites. So your website will often start with www, meaning it's in that file cabinet for the internet. Here's the interesting thing. People all around the world are looking for information on the World Wide Web about exactly what you do with your business. So if you're a career counselor or if you're a business counselor, they're looking for information that you can share with them about how they can find their next job better, how they can retool their business and pivot for what's coming ahead or whatever your business is. So. What we want to do is make sure that we get you in front of those folks who are looking for your information. First off, let's describe the number of people who are out there. Now we know that there are a lot of people all over the world who use the internet, but the people who are called your community are those folks who subscribe to your blog, they like your Facebook page. So they've made some kind of contact with you. Smaller than your community is your tribe. These are the folks who love your product or service. They write positive reviews about your business. They like, comment, or share your content. These people are very nice. We like them. But the people we really love are these guys. These are your evangelists. There's a small group within your tribe who absolutely adore your product or service. They talk to you or they talk about your product or services to their social media circles. They buy from you. So these folks are the ones you really wanna get in front of and they're called your evangelists. Um, the largest group of the people who are on the internet obviously is everybody who's on the internet. Your community is a smaller group, your tribe is smaller than that, 
your evangelists are a smaller group than your tribe. So how do you grow your sales on the web? Well, this is a, an illustration from Dr. Seuss. These are the who's down in Whoville. Uh, what we need to do is find more who's for your business. These are the people, the evangelists who like your product or service and buy it. To help the who's, the people out there, find you. You need to have a website and you need to be active on at least one social media channel. The reason for this is, is it's actually a rule from Google. So unless you have a website, unless you are on at least one social media channel, and that could be Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever, as long as you're on one and a website, Google is willing to uh, what's called index your content, which means it allows other people to find what you've written. What you need to do is you need to find your keywords. I am going to go into that and put those keywords about your products and services and your customers or your company story into the content that you're writing. Then people can find you. And hopefully they become the people who buy from you. How can you update your website? People ask this all the time. And the reason that it's an important question is unless you're constantly updating your website at least once a month, Google thinks you're on a permanent vacation. So you do want to at least once a month add a new blog post, a new landing page, or a new web page. That way Google knows you're still live and it'll increase your page ranking. All right, now, next part, you need to select one social media channel and post there at least once a month in the same seven day period, you posted new content on your website. So many people pick Facebook because it is the largest social media platform in the world. The only nation in the world that actually has more people is China. So you're getting in front of a lot of people of a lot of different ages all around the world on Facebook. If your business is one that reaches out to other businesses or other professional individuals, you might wanna think of being on LinkedIn instead of Facebook because you're connecting with those people who potentially can become your customers. Which channel you pick is up to you. I'm happy to help, Gustavo is happy to help. Hmm. Screen froze there for a second, sorry about that. The keys to your website being found by more who's, which is our goal. Number one, is your website responsive? A responsive website actually changes shape depending upon the screen size you're on. So it will shrink to fit a phone. It will expand to fit a PC or a laptop. If a website is responsive, this is one of the factors that Google uses to decide, do you have the potential to get onto page one? There are a whole lot of other factors, but you need to be aware of this. Secondarily, oops, went the wrong direction. Sorry about that. Um, why is this important? Well, nearly 60% of all on online searches now take place on a phone or um, an iPad, a tablet, a mobile device. Because of the fact that people are looking for information on a smaller screen, if your website doesn't adapt and they're only seeing part of your information, like a column right down the center, people will go look at one of your competitors instead. So. This is important. Key number two, be mobile friendly. Mobile friendly is designed to look exactly the same way, no matter which device you're using. Now you can actually be mobile friendly and mobile responsive. There are web designers who can bring this about. And many of our smaller do-it-yourself platforms like Weebly and Wix can allow you to do it too. So the content is the same on every screen that it's displayed on. 
it has very simplified navigation when you go to mobile friendly. It's very easy to move around. Third way that you get onto Google's page one, which is where most searches occur, and that's why you want to be there. You do want to write in proper English or in proper Spanish, depending upon what market you're in. In 2015, Google required that we write in a 12th grade level of English or whatever language we were using. The reason was they wanted to essentially um, not allow a lot of people to compete for page one. So by saying right at 12th grade, which makes most of us sound like masterpiece theater, they narrowed the number of people who could get onto page one. Good news is this is now eighth grade. So eighth grade English still, you're not splitting infinitives, you're not using prepositions at the end of words. So you are writing in a way that is consistent with eighth grade English. I've done a lot of editing. If I can help you, let me know. Basically, Google is the world's toughest English teacher. So <laughs> they have been sticklers for the way that we write in English or Spanish or any language that we wish, but that we write in an educated and professional manner. If we don't, we never make it to page one. My suggestion is before you actually design your website, that you actually write out your keyword rich content before you ever start the technical wizardry, I'll put it that way. So you want to write that content for your basic pages, and I'll get to that in a minute. And then if you do decide to use a website designer, you've got the content ready to go. This is going to save you time and money in the long run because you're not paying the designer to start and then the designer has to wait for you to turn in your content. All right, key number four to getting onto Google's page one, post regularly and consistently both on-site and off-site. On-site is new content on your website. That could be a blog post, a web page, a landing page. Offsite is any one social media channel. If you post in more than one social media channel, that's fine, but you have to be on at least one. So, so long as you've got new content going up within a seven day period uh, on your blog and on one social media channel, and you do that at least once a month, Google knows you're live. If you do it more often than that, it's much easier for you to get onto page one. Okay, I want you to think back to Sunday school and Noah's Ark. Remember the animals went into the ark two by two, two giraffes, two kitty cats, two penguins, etc. Google apparently graduated Sunday school and we're very grateful to know this. So Google looks for you to post in pairs and you can vary those pairs depending upon what you want to do, but it's one offsite, one onsite. So it could be a new blog post and a Facebook post. It could be a landing page with a LinkedIn update. It could be a web page and a new Instagram story. So you can mix up those pairs however you want to do it. Key number five, be the first to post that content on that subject, at least worded the way you did. Now, Eric is on on the call today. He's actually business counselor like I am, and so is Gustavo. So if I were to write an article about the history of the economic injury disaster, so long as Gustavo and so long as Eric wrote in different words, if they didn't use all of my words in my order, they would get credit for being the first to post. But if I write an article about EIDL and somebody way over there in Nebraska takes my content, puts it on their Facebook page, they get no credit whatsoever. So just be careful. You can always rewrite somebody's content. Google can search for copyright violations in as little as three words. That's very, very small. 
So they're looking at my content, Gustavo's content, Eric's content, everybody else's content. We are all allowed to use generic words like to the lake because nobody has a right to be the only person to write to the lake. But if I say, on a glorious spring day, I strolled to Lake Winnipesaukee and I heard the bluebirds sing, and somebody takes that sentence word for word, they're gonna get hit with a copyright violation by Google. So just be careful, but don't worry. You can use generic words, no problem whatsoever. Copyright is your friend. That's the copyright symbol. When you're writing, you're earning copyright. The first copyright you earn is called poor man's copyright. It's not defendable in court, which means you can't go in and sue somebody for taking your content, but you are allowed to use the copyright statement. If you see the next bullet there, it says the copyright symbol 2021, the right stuff, all rights reserved. So even though I might not have filed for copyright, I can still put that statement at the end of my content. And that's going to scare off 80 to 85% of the people. They won't try to take my content. I am going to go for an extra step. And that's apply for official copyright at the US Copyright Office. And what I do is I write a stack of social media content. And I get one copyright for 35 to 55 bucks for the whole stack. I'm not getting copyright each time I write. Marvin Gaye's heirs were able to win 7.4 million when Robin Thicke and Farrell uh, infringed on two bars of music. Two, that's about probably eight notes, little itty bit, but they got 7.4 million. So that's why it's important to have official copyright. You can copyright your entire website and your content. I can go into this in greater detail. Here's the link for the US Copyright Office. What we're discovering with the pandemic is that people have gotten lazier and lazier and it's much easier for them to take the content of somebody's website, change just a few things and boom, put the entire website up as their own. If you have copyright, if you have official copyright, you can pay a lawyer two to 300 bucks. They will send a letter on their letterhead to the offending turkey over there and tell them to release the content. That's far easier than not copywriting your site. And as one of my clients had to do, he had to pay his lawyer $10,000 to get his website back from somebody who copied it. But he didn't have official copyright. And so it was a long drawn out legal battle. Key number six, use your keywords. Keywords are like bait when you go fishing. If you want to catch a salmon or a trout, you're probably going to use a different bait than you would if you went after a sailfish or a barracuda or something bigger. It's the same thing with keywords. So the keywords for an attorney are going to be way different from the keywords for a business coach. I can help you find those keywords in like first grade. You're going to put those keywords into your content. So we're going to get ready to prepare for your website design. This is all the background work that you want to do before you talk to a professional designer or before you sign up with Wix, Weebly, Score, any of these do-it-yourself sites. So you do want to write content for your homepage about us or about the company, your products and services, contact page and set up a blog. And a blog is a searchable index of the content you've written. So let's say I'm going to do a blog for a company that helps people pass the CPA exam. I might have one category of content that has to do with study tips, another category that has to do with test taking tips, another with content for the exam. So when I post something onto the blog, a piece of content, I can say it goes in this category or that category, and then somebody can actually search for all the content in a particular category. 
and get a full uh, picture of the information. Two, select your images or photos. Uh, you can go to free sites like Unsplash or Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S, and get free images that you can use. They're copyright free, so you're not gonna get a nasty letter. You can also use your own photos as well. So we've got a lot of different options for you to put images on your website. Your other option is to sign up and subscribe to a photo site where you can keep receipts for the images that you've paid for and prove you had a right to use them. Here's a fun tip. Look at your competitors in another city. So let's say I've got a client who's a florist. I'm going to have her, we'll say it's a her, I'm going to have her look at the best uh, florist in another city. Maybe it's Minneapolis, Minnesota. But she, she can look at these websites, discover what, what does she like, what does she not like. So when she starts designing, she's already picked out her color palette, she's picked out a, a font, she knows what she wants to do. So that's why you wanna look at your competitors, but do it in a different city so that there's less likelihood that you might inadvertently infringe on the copyright. Okay, first step to getting a website, you need a domain name. Just like your house has an address out in front, it might be 306 Morningside Terrace, your website has an address as well, and nobody else lives at that website. That website is called, excuse me, that address is called a domain name. How do you get one? Well, GoDaddy is probably one of the bigger providers of domain names and probably the one that you recognize most readily. What I normally suggest is go to Google or any of the search engines, look for GoDaddy domain name coupon. And sometimes you can get a coupon for 99 cents. Yay. Hang on to your coupon. Make a list of 10 or more domain names that you would like to have. Shorter is better than longer. Standard spelling is better than inventive spellings because if you're trying to rattle off the name of your website to somebody, you don't want to have to keep repeating that instead of ending with an S, the title of your website ends with a Z, <laughs> so things of that nature. If your business is um, something that people would run into frequently, let's say Joe's Plumbing, you can add your state abbreviation. So you can say, Joe's Plumbing Oregon or Joe's Plumbing OR. And that way you might have a chance of getting that particular domain. Mess around with it, you'll find it. Uh, at GoDaddy, enter your first choice with your coupon in hand. If it's available, buy that thing now. Because if you don't, there are people inside the company that realizing you've searched for it will actually buy it and raise the price. Why do you want a website? Well, a couple of different reasons. Maybe you have an objective and maybe you've got a clear purpose and hopefully you've got them both. So maybe you want to increase sales via lead generation, have that website sending you people who can buy from you. Or maybe you want to develop your credibility as an expert witness. I'm going to go back to Eric. I'm going to pick on him for a second. So let's say he wants to become an expert witness working with lawyers who are dealing with um, age discrimination or wrongful termination uh, cases. So Eric might frame his website about how many years of experience he has as a career counselor, what depth of experience he has, why he would be a great expert witness for a lawyer who needs to prove something in court. So you've got two different kinds of websites here, improving your reputation or improving sales. Yes, you can combine them both. Okay. What is good web design? <laughs> the answer to this changes on a regular basis simply because we keep inventing new technology. 
and new ways of presenting our information. So what you're looking for is a website that is visually appealing to your target market. If you're a florist and you want to appeal to people who are getting married, then obviously you want to appeal to people who are planning flowers for a wedding. And that's going to be entirely different from somebody who creates drones that are capable of uh, carrying 1,320 pounds. That's called a class three drone in case anybody ever asks you. So you want to appeal to the audience that you're trying to reach. You also want to be looking at the colors, the images, what the website looks like. You also want to be looking at a Google approved font. So it will open on Google. That is very vertical. Uh, try to stay away from Times New Roman or any of the serif fonts. They're harder for people to read who are over 40 because the letters hang out to the side. So stay away from them if you possibly can. Also, if you're using a font that is copyrighted, you're probably going to have to pay the person to use it. I had one person who designed their entire website using a font that looked like it should have been used in uh, Lord of the Rings. It was that kind of a stylized um, font. And when I discovered that it was a copyrighted font, she'd have to pay $300 to use it. She picked another font, okay? Colors, I mentioned colors just a minute ago. Colors actually communicate without saying anything at all. If you look at the colors on flags, red uh, signals um, courage, blue signals fidelity and trustworthiness. It's the same with your website. Colors tell a story. So you wanna look at what these colors mean and then decide on a color palette for what you're trying to do. So white can signal purity, but if it's the wrong shade of white, it can look very, very sterile on a website. So you do want to check these out and see how they display. Gray can be very professional, very crisp. Gray and silver, same family. Brown, and by the way, you will be getting a copy of these slides, so don't feel that you have to write everything down right at the moment. Uh, brown on a website, it convert, it conveys being out in nature, trees, earthiness, woodsiness, it's subtle. <laughs> cool colors, green, blue, and purple, actually have very soothing abilities when we're looking at them. So they signify everything from status and wealth to royalty. So look at the different colors, look at the different shades, see what you think. Warm colors, yellow, orange, pink, and red are sometimes referred to as our fire colors. You can use these as accents, you can use them as main colors. Again, you're getting the slides, don't worry. So let's get graphic with images. What kinds of images do you want? Well, number one, you do want images of, of your products and your services, but you also want images of your team a professional headshot of you, of your workspace, things that make people feel comfortable with you and want to buy from you. So look at the different other websites that compete with yours. If you're a leadership coach, look at other leadership coaches. Find out what they're doing on their images and then follow along, make your own. Okay, your menu. On a website, it doesn't necessarily serve up food, it serves up the information. So what you want is a menu that functions best for your website. There are various places on the website that the menu can be put, and we'll go into this. So what is a website theme? If you look at most of, oh, excuse me, if you look at all of your DIY sites, they will have different themes. So different themes for a dentist rather than for a women's dress shop. 
So you've got a lot of different options there. Look at the themes, see which one conveys your information the best. Huh, this is an interesting uh, visual presentation on your website. This has become very popular since 2016. It's called flat design. It means that everything looks very two dimensional. And for certain types of websites, this is a beautiful way to present your information. For others, not as much. When you're looking at a website theme, you do wanna make sure that developer support is available. Especially if you're going through a DIY site, you wanna look at that particular theme and then look at how much developer support there is for it. Did they come out with different versions of it? Or has this not been touched for five years? If that's the case, you may wanna pick something else because there may not be anybody who can give you the hints you need to make the darn thing work. Make sure that visitors, users of your website can easily contact you. So you may wanna have a click to call button. You may wanna have a chat now button. Uh, there are any number of types of these buttons that you should have at least one of these on each page because somebody may not come into your home page because of the way they searched. They may actually land on page three or four because of the keywords they used. So make sure that you've got that click to call button or chat button on every page. Here's another thing to check before you select a particular theme. Does it have a lot of apps, plugins, and extensions? This allows you to customize the look, feel, and action of your website. If there aren't a lot of these, eh, pick another uh, website theme because you may not be getting the support you need. This is one thing you do want to add. It's the importance of an eblast signup, and I will be covering how to write eblast in class five, which will be coming up in six weeks. I think it is. I do these classes every other week. This is actually the eblast signup for a website called Newington's, which uh, caters to cat-focused people. Hence the uh, purchase. Uh, cute little play on words. Anyway, if you give them your email address, you then get a coupon for 10% off your first purchase. That way, anyone who signs up through that has given permission to Mewington's for Mewington's to send an e-blast on a regular basis that educates and sells. If you just start spamming people, you can get a really bad reputation, so don't do that. What's interesting about these uh, sign-up forms is that about 67% of all website visitors are willing to sign up if they're interested in the product or service, but only 33% of websites actually have that subscription box. So please consider doing it. What you wanna look for once you do get your website up and going, if you've done a DIY, a do it yourself, <laughs> you do want to copy and paste that URL into your browser. What that will do is it will allow you to see how does your website display on different browsers because while Google does about 86% of the searches out there, there are other browsers that could completely mess up your website if you're not careful. I know you may be feeling this way, it's okay. There are hundreds, if not thousands of templates how do you figure out which one to select for your business and for what you want to do? Well, um, you want to look at a number of different factors. And I'm going to go into these one by one so that you can get an idea of the different options that you've got. This is called full width content. What this means is that that first image on your homepage goes all the way across the top of the screen. For some types of websites, this is perfect. 
Uh, it is very mobile responsive. It's very good for graphic heavy websites. So artists, designers, architects, people like that who are gonna be using a lot of images. This is lovely. Next type is a different format for that front page. It's called boxed width. And while this picture doesn't show as clearly as I would like, there's actually white space around the picture. So the picture isn't going all the way to the edge. This is a more expected format. People are used to seeing it. It's perfect for very traditional website designs. So when you're looking at templates, figure out, do you want full width or do you want a boxed width? This is another way of doing the homepage. So if you're in travel, leisure, restaurant, something that is very visually grabbing, you may want to look at this. This is a huge image with just a few words. And then you're able to give somebody an instant idea of what it is you do. Here's another way. Static header with image and content. So you've got the picture, but you've got content. You've got a few words, a few more words than the, the previous format. So you can tell more about what it is that you do as a business. You can have a headline, a supporting paragraph, a call to action, a supporting image even within that bar. Slideshow. A lot of people love the slideshow. The slideshow allows you to have multiple images, which could be actually uh, testimonials for your business with a picture behind that testimony. So you could do one testimonial after another. So somebody gets onto the homepage, they can see how many people love you and what they enjoy about how you have been able to help them. So you can have photos of different products. You can have testimonials. You can use photos of your travel site of different locations where you travel. That carousel can be used for any number of different things. Can you do a video background? Yes, absolutely. If what you're doing is very visual, like in this case, it's frying a steak or um, excuse me, grilling a steak, apologize, uh, you can actually have a video of the flames going up under whatever it is you're cooking. Make somebody hungry, make them want to run out the door and go buy whatever it is you're selling or call Grubhub and have it delivered. So a video is another thing you can put on your homepage to engage people with what you're doing. Menu bar design, <laughs> again, doesn't refer to food, but it does refer to how people can navigate around your website. You do want a very simple, clean design. You want something that's easy to read, easy to click on. Now, there are a lot of different places you can put the menu bar. Again, choices. Most typical is putting uh, the menu bar up at the top. But what you want to make sure of is that it's not cluttered. You don't have a whole lot of information in there that drives people nuts. So you want to make sure that you've got clear tabs. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can also put the menu bar in a different location. There are no rules as to where you put the menu bar. So you can put it at the bottom of the page, left side, the right side, the top, whatever you want to do. This is a top horizontal menu bar. So we do have menu tabs at the top, but we also have different categories going down the left side. Again, if you have a lot of products, if you have a lot of services, this might be an option. You've got the side vertical menu. So the entire menu is on that left side. And then different sections within each of those tabs is right next to it. This is very popular with restaurants, spas, other graphics heavy businesses where you've got a lot of products and services. Bottom horizontal bar. Well, 
I have to say that folks in interior design, architecture, artists, and other folks who have a lot of images love the menu bar at the bottom. Uh, it became kind of a trademark of those sites for a while and still is. So if you go look up an architect, probably you wanna look at the bottom of the screen to see where the menu bar is. The nest, your headlines. Now, anything that you put on that front page can have different hierarchies, different sizes of fonts. So your biggest headlines need to be something that really grab the person's interest. So the five best ways to get rich without working nine to five, that would be a headline that would grab people. Here's what you don't know about SEO that could be hurting your business. So that takes it's a negative approach, what you don't know is hurting you, rather than here's information that can help you. So think about your headlines, think about what you want to do to draw people in. This question comes up all the time. I bet Gustavo's answered it half a dozen times this week alone. Should you design your own or should you hire a designer? It really comes down to two questions. If you can't afford three to $10,000 right now for a professionally designed website, my suggestion is that you do a do-it-yourself DIY website right now. As you make sales, as your business gets healthier and stronger, at that point, reach out to a professional designer who can then either start from scratch or take your website and make it even more visually stunning. So it really depends on your situation. Preparation is the key. So you do wanna make your content, you do wanna write your content before you ever start an account with Weebly or Wix or find a professional developer. You do want to select your graphics. Those are your images, your pictures. You do want to select the categories that you want your blog content divided into. And I always suggest you have a category called general or potpourri or something like that, because one day you're going to write a blog post that doesn't fit into one of your categories and you need to be able to put it somewhere. So general information works every time. You do need to pick a color scheme. Which colors do you want to use? Which hues within those colors? Because as we all know, green has a whole lot of different shades. And so you want to pick the green you want or yellow or red or whatever it is you're doing. You do want to select a font so that you know exactly what your words are going to look like on the page. And you might need a shopping cart depending upon what it is you do and how you do it. Okay, great news. We made it to the end. We went zipping through 60, over 60 slides. So that's why I was talking like a used car saleswoman. Uh, if you would like to reach out to me, this is the uh, email address and that's my office number. You can also reach out to Gustavo and Gustavo can get in contact with me. If you would like Gustavo to participate uh, because he is in your neck of the woods, or because he speaks more Spanish than I do, that is also an opportunity for you and both of us are happy to meet with you.